So anyway, good morning. Uh, and the next slide will give you a little bit of bio about me. So my name is Andy Sarkani. Andy is a nickname. It came about in 1957 when I came to this country. In a college, there were students who were teaching me English because I didn't know one word. And the young lady, her name is Fanny May, says, I cannot pronounce your first name, but you sound like Andy. So I have been Andy from day one. I was born in Budapest, Hungary, October 31st of 1936. I didn't know much about Halloween until when I was in this country. So last Halloween, I was at the age of 86, feeling 39. OK. Uh, I have been speaking to students like you, younger ones, adults, churches, synagogues all over in the country, particularly with Zoom, over 15 years. I have spoken to over 10,000 students uh, here in the state of Connecticut. I have been married. Now, God willing, it will be 53 years in July. The same lady. Marriage is very hard work. Don't underestimate it. I'm still learning. Okay. My wife and I, we have two children, a daughter and a son, five grandchildren. Two of them currently studying uh, religious studies in Jerusalem. And God willing, I will be seeing them in May. So that's enough for me. The next slide will tell you a little bit about geography. Here's a map of Europe, and you can see the red circle around the country where I was born called Hungary. It's quite tiny. Geography changes almost daily. If you look at the map of Hungary in the 1800s, it's about four times bigger than it is. The next slide will show you a little bit more detailed about the country. On the west, you have Austria. In the north, the country which are now over the list of two countries, it used to be called Czechoslovakia. When you are moving to the east, Ukraine, and Romania. Basically, southeast is Romania. Anything but you can see the bordering with Hungary is called Transylvania. Transylvania. That whole part used to be Hungary. When you are moving to the southwest, that used to be called Yugoslavia. It's eight different countries. So geography changes. The river Danube coming in from the Black Forest into Hungary, coming from the German Austrian border, and it takes a 90 degree turn. When it comes to Hungary, go south eventually to the Black Sea. Budapest located about 50 miles of that 90 degree turn, or sometimes called the dog leg. Uh, Bud Budapest used to be two cities. On the west side was Buddha, on the east side is past. The next slide is really will tell you something about us, you, I, and everybody else. This poem written by a German Lutheran minister, and it's very important to understand that you cannot be a bystander ever. You need to be an upstander. You need to speak up and not procrastinating about it. If something you see is wrong, incorrect, is bothering you, you need to talk about it right then and there. Don't wait somebody else do it for you. And the poem will tell you very simple what a bystander is, who's doing nothing. Okay, it says, First they came for the communists, and I did not object because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I did not object because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the labor leaders, 
And I did not object because I wasn't a labor leader. Then they came for the Jews. I, I didn't object because I wasn't a Jew. Read the last two lines. They came for me. And there was no one left to object. That's a bystander, watching what go by and not to do anything about it. And if you speak up, you are helping yourself, helping your family, your fellow students, society at large. Not to tolerate things are which is inappropriate. The next slide is actually very important because that will cre creating a relationship between you and I. See, now we are very distant cousin. Elie Wiesel, who received the Nobel Peace Prize for his effort for human rights, he wrote a book about his life as a child titled Night. It's only 99 pages in a paperback, and I highly advise you if you're interested in human rights and interested about Holocaust to read it. You can read it in one afternoon very casually. In his book on night, he wrote something very significant. Whoever listens to a witness, and you are the listening and I am the witness, becomes a witness. Therefore, you who have first-hand primary source information, then you hear someone who survived the Budapest ghetto as a child and lived through Nazi occupation of Hungary. It's so important because anti-Semitism today is growing in leaps and bounds. It didn't, didn't end then with the Second World War. There are thousands of incidents occurring in this country against Jews, but not only against Jews, against Muslims, against blacks, against Asian Americans. We live in a very difficult times. So we need to remember that. There are too many Holocaust deniers. Go to the next slide. People saying that the Holocaust never happened. Look at it. There are over six million Jews were killed, slaughtered by the Nazi fascist government of Germany. Beside that, there were other groups of people. Jews have two sayings. Never again, which is very specifically addressing the Holocaust. What happened never should have happened, and we need to prevent it to happening today. But we never learn from history. Current. You listen to the news, you look at the paper, you will hear about the Ukraine. That is, and this is my opinion, you can form yours. That tug called Vladimir Putin, just about a year ago, attacked Ukraine for personal gain. See, he was a KGB agent who lived under the Soviet Union and that system. And when Gorbachev was the head of Soviet Union, he broke it up into many different states. This guy is trying to reactivate the former Soviet Union. He felt that Ukraine is the prime target, attacked a sovereign nation, and killing tens and hundreds of thousands of people. Just personal gain. Okay. So this is today. So did we learn? No. We had Kosovo, we had Darfur, we had all kinds of atrocities occurred over the past many years. It's all after Second World War. So the Holocaust did happen. There are millions of pages of documents existing which proving that right. And you can see a very good movie called The Denial. And if you see it, you will exactly understand how people are falsifying history. And they are falsifying history today, just recently. And I don't go into very detailed. The next slide will only tell you a fact. Then Adolf Hitler became a chancellor of Germany of January 30th of 1933. And Jewish life 
almost instantaneously deteriorated to the pits. See, Hitler had a vision to creating a superior race called the Aryan nation. I call him racial purification. He not only targeted the Jews, but all targeted many other groups of people. Jehovah Witnesses, the Blacks, the Slovaks, the Gypsies, Handicap, and there are many others. He wanted to eliminate all these people because he felt that it is a detriment to society. He was a devastating dictator. The next slide is very significant because in my point of view, on that day, November 9th of 1938, the Holocaust, in my judgment, really started. By 1938, there were concentration camps existed all over in Europe, and there were already death camps were built with gas chambers and crematoriums. And they were already transported people all around. But that day was significant, because the German government organized, the government, the, na the nation of Germany organized programs. And during that time, practically every Jewish businesses were broken in, looted, robbed, all over in Germany. Not only that, but Jews were dra dragged out of their homes, verbally, physically abused. One example, and you can check it on Google. There is a picture there where you can see who Jews were taken out of their homes. See, at that time, the streets were not asphalt, but cobblestones. And they were made them to bring their toothbrush, to brush the cobblestones with their toothbrush. And thousands of Germans around watching them and make a mockery of them. Synagogues were burned down, and the firefighters were just watching it and clapping and welcoming the total, total destruction of Jewish life and Jewish religion. That's what Nazi Germany, the fascist government, promoted. The next slide, I'll show you one simple picture in a German street. However, there is something very significant on that picture, why I picked it. On the far right up, you can see a symbol, the symbol of the swastika. Swastika representing Nazi Germany. And also it represents, in my definition, two things. Hate and killing. So be very careful when you speak and make sure that you eliminate the word hate out of your vocabulary permanently. Because hate caused all the evil in the past, caused all the evil today. And if you don't eliminate it, it will cause the evil in the, in the future. Okay. I would like to suggest to you to replace the word hate with two other four-letter words. And if you understand the meaning, a real meaning, not just casually, a real meaning, you will be a happy camper the rest of your life. We use hate very casually. For example, you are sitting in a dinner table, and your mother or your father, whoever is the chef for the day, serve a meal. And you look something, and you find something on the table which is strange. And then you say, I hate that. No, you don't. You didn't even taste it. But that's an instinct. So you say, I don't know what it is, but probably I dislike it. Or you're walking in a mall and looking at the windows, and you see what's going on, and then you see something very strange. And you say, I hate that outfit. No, you don't. That's not my type. English language is very rich. So use that language properly to replace the word hate. 
Hate, hate need to be replaced with two words, love and hope, both four letter words. If you understand its attributes, you will be always happy. Here are the attributes I wrote down. Trust, respect, care, honor, compromise, outreach, and stability. And if you truly understand the meaning of those words, you will be always successful, always. Now let's talk about Hungary and my family. As soon as Hitler took power, the Hungarian region, to the head of the Hungarian government, Miklos Horthy, visited Hitler in Germany. And he made a commitment that the Hungarian nation, the people of Hungary, will support Nazi Germany's mission to deportate, de deportation of Jews to various concentration camps and eventually kill them. Not only that, but use the Jews as slave laborer to support the war, war effort. He was deposed by late 1943, early 1944. About my family, my father had a small construction business. My mother was his assistant. My grandfather was partnered with my father. We made, my parents made a reasonable living up to 1940. But in 1940, they made a decision to make a, a significant move, which actually slipped and go to the next slide. To this building, I took this picture from Google, but I could take you, my cell phone and show it to you, the same picture I took last August when I took my children there to show them that their mother and father grown up. We moved into uh, this building in 1940. The significance of the building is multitude. The ground floor, what you see, the small windows, to the right and left of the gate was a nursery kindergarten school. This is where I went to kindergarten. Fully equipped. On the top floor, where you see those large windows, it was a ballet acrobat and a dance studio. It had significance because there were a lot of space was available. This building became an orphanage for over 150 Jewish kids by 1944 ages 3 to about 14. Because we lived in this building, it provided a safe haven for all of us. At the time, we didn't know that, but it just turned out. It is located in the 7th district of Budapest. It was very heavily populated at the time by Jews. It accommodated Jewish life, had synagogues, kosher bakeries, kosher butchers, restaurants. My life changed drastically in 1943. I was held back because I was born in October. So my mother enrolled me to school, first grade, and the next slide showed you the school. By the way, that building, what I showed it to you, the Grand floor is still a nursery kindergarten school. No change. Okay. Here is the picture where I went to first grade. So in the fall of 1943, my mother took me to school. The two buildings I showed it to you is only about two blocks apart. So you didn't have to worry about cars because I never knew what a car is. It was sort of only in the picture. There were some taxis and only the very elite who had chauffeur-driven cars. Transportation was by streetcars, buses, and horse and buggies. You see horses all the time in a major capital city of our country. So my mother, after a couple of weeks, said, Andy, you can walk to school on your own. It's only two blocks. 
So I was a very proud little seven-year-old. My mother allowed me to walk to school. So I am walking. And after a few days of going through that two blocks walk, I told my mother, I cannot work, I cannot go to school any longer. She said, what's going on? And I explained, very simple. On my way to two blocks, people called me names. A dirty Jew. The Jews should be killed. They should not be part of society. Some of these slogans, I didn't understand what the heck it meant. But they spit on me, hit me, pushed me to the pavement. I am a seven-year-old kid. What did I do wrong? I tell you what it is. I am a Jew. That was the only reason. What a seven-year-old that do wrong? Walking to school. Devastating. They were the Hungarian Nazis. Hungary had a Nazi party called the Arrow Cross Party. And as soon as Hitler took power in 33, the membership of the party swelled up in large numbers. Young, old, men, women. The hatred of Jews existed in a major way. And I like to tell you a personal opinion. I went back to Hungary several times after being in the United States. I actually married a Hungarian girl. I felt anti-Semitism in this country every time I went there. Last August, when I left and came back to the States, I said, thanks God. Major changes over the many, many years. In the meanwhile, my father was in forced labor camp after 1940 on a regular basis. Now, what is a forced labor camp? It was a local activities for the Nazis. They rounded up the Jews from their home and took them to places to do slave labor, supposedly supporting the war effort. When a particular job was finished, anybody who survived those harsh conditions of no food almost and water, very poor facilities. Then they came and took them away again. My mother was basically a single mother. And she had to go to work to try to find some kind of a way to put food on the table to supporting me and my father's parents who lived with us. My father was able to come home from one of these uh, situations, end of 1943 in December, and the first thing my parents did to look for family members who lived in the periphery of our southern district. Hungary had 24 districts, but the southern district was very centrally located. They found by walking and taking the streetcars to rounding up family members and moved into our two-room apartment in that building I showed it to you. Thanks God for that smart move of my parents. How we turned to 1944, the Hungarian government changed, was deposed, a puppet Nazi government was put in place, and in the meanwhile, the former Hungarian government reached out to the Allied forces, to the United States, to help them, help Hungary out of the commitment. What they made years ago to Nazi Germany, to Adolf Hitler. The German intelligence caught up very quickly and made a decision to occupy the country. And let's go to the next slide. On a pass side, which is the east side of the River Danube, there's a beautiful boulevard called the Ring Road. The radio was announcing that the Nazis are going to come and march in, at the Ring Road. Tens of thousands of people were landing up on the sidewalks and cheating the Nazis walk in, in black boots, in goose having gone 
And guess what? They were wearing an armband, all of them. What is on air? Swastika, hate and killing. That's what it represented. Unbelievable. And the Hungarians were clapping, the welcoming. My grandfather took me out to the ring road, which was only three blocks away from the house I showed it to you. And I was seeing it with my naked eye. And after a while, my grandfather said, Andy, I take you home. You have seen more than enough. And on the way home, he said, Andy, our life as Jews will permanently change. I didn't really understand what that meant. But it happened over 80 years ago, and I never forgotten the image, what I have seen. was devastating. So let's, for a moment, freeze history in March of 1944. And go to the next slide. I came home on the afternoon of August 11th of 2017. I turned the television on and listening to the news. I couldn't believe my eyes and my ears what I have seen and what I heard at the news. A bunch of white supremacist thugs were marching in Charlottesville, Virginia and saying the same slogans, what I have heard as a seven-year-old, back to the Jews. The Jews are bloodsuckers. The Jews don't belong to our society. It's de destroying our life. I couldn't believe, I was shaking when I was hearing these slogans from these thugs. And guess what? Wearing an armband with a swastika on her. On that day, there was a young lady was killed. Dozens of people ended up in a hospital with severe injuries, and hundreds of them were emotionally distressed. This never should have happened in the United States. This is the greatest country in the world, but this kind of anti-Semitism and hatred never should have happened. As a note, the following day our former president gave a speech related to the demonstration or whatever it is called. And he said, and I was shocked when I heard that one, there are good people on both sides. My dear friends, there is no good Nazi. Nazi has one purpose in life, one purpose is kill and hate, nothing else. And when you see that swastika anytime, just think about it. That swastika represented the killing of over six million Jews. Gas them and burn them to ashes. If you go and Google, there are, you will find over 50 major white supremacist groups existing. The Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the whole philosophy of Koanon. You have a so-called artist, and you have more familiar with that than I am. His name is Kenya West. He has millions of people following him on social media. He is corrupting with his thinking of young people like you, because he's promoting anti-Semitic statements and Holocaust denial. But I can go on and tell you many other examples. So go to the next slide. And that was even more shocking. It just happened two years ago. Before I talk to you about the slide, I'd like to tell you that Auschwitz-Birkenau, there are two small villages in Poland side by side. I actually will be visiting Auschwitz-Birkenau in the middle of April with a mission, going with about 30 adults to talking about the Holocaust and seeing it in person. Auschwitz was the most vicious death camp existed during the Holocaust. There are over 1.2 million Jews were gassed and burned in crematoriums. About 200 to 250,000 of them were children, 
ages very young through your age. That's what the Nazis did. So, on the right hand side, you will see, to me, a useless human being wearing a sweatshirt saying Camp Auschwitz. It happened two years ago in an insurrection in the capital. Anti Semitism never disappeared. The hatred of Jews is existing every day. On the left hand side, I put that slide there to showing you what these white supremacist thugs were doing. While they were attacking the capital, they were also screaming, top of their lung, hang the vice president. They set up a gallow. Vice President Pence was there to verifying the election which was held in the prior months. It was his constitutional duty. He was trying to get him, and literally, what they said, hang him. So don't forget, our Constitution is a very fragile document. Our forefather in 1776 said so. And you and I must protect it all the time. Protect our freedom, the freedom that you have. And no one else has it anywhere else in the world except us Americans. Let's go back to Hungary, 1944. Next slide will show you that Hitler dispatched Adolf Eichmann doing one thing, to expedite the deportation of Hungarian Jews to their death. Hungary had approximately 650,000 of population of Jews. About over 90% of the population was Roman Catholic. That man managed to organize an assembly line transportation and killings of over 550,000 Hungarian Jews. Practically all of them ended up in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Just as a note, when talking about a number which was tattooed into people's hands, it was only occurred in Auschwitz. So if anybody who survived be able to show a number. All other countries, it wasn't happening. But he was responsible for over five million people during Second World War to their death. And he was very proud of it. In six weeks, he managed to do that. The next slide show you a map of Europe, which you have seen before. Ignore the sizes and the colors of the dots. They were all concentration camps, and that camps existed in Europe during the period of time of the Nazi occupation of the country. You can see over here on the right, right hand side, Auschwitz-Birkenau, in the middle in the south called, in Austria, Mauthausen, when you go to Germany, three major dead camps were Bergen-Belsen, Buchenwald, and Dachau. They were the, the major ones, but there were thousands of them. And in these camps, the Jews were slave laborers and eventually were slaughtered. The next slide is a very personal one. You will see on the left hand side a picture of my mother and my father taken in 1940 in a village where my mother was born and my parents got married, called Dunaharaste. The significance of that village is really very significant. Beside the native tongue of, native tongue, tongue of Hungarian, everybody, with no exception, spoke a German dialogue called Schwab. Schwabia actually located in the southwest corner of Germany. It was so distinct that many average German had difficulty of understanding. And I'll talk to you about it slightly later. 
on the right hand side, you will see a picture when Hungarian Jews arrived to a, a concentration camp. I don't know which one. I couldn't figure it out. But to the far right, that gentleman with the glasses and a hat is my father. They were still wearing civilian clothes. Because all the Jews were taken to these camps, they stripped everything from them and gave them a uniform and put them to slave labor. The next couple of slides will tell you what really happened with the Hungarian Jews. The next slide show you, I call him a cattle car. Some people refer to the freight car. In these cattle cars, Jews were crammed in there like sardines. No water, no food, no facilities, and shipped them to various concentration camps and death camps. Took them three, four days by the time they get to his destination. This particular cattle car, what you say, is on this display for commemorating what happened with the Jews in the gates of Auschwitz-Birkenau. The next slide, by the way, these pictures, what in the next slide shows, they were all taken by Nazis. So they cannot deny what they did. When the train arrives to Auschwitz, Birkenau, and they open the doors and get them out, they went through a selection process, what you can see on the left hand side. Actually, there were a third group, and let me address that one. German physicians were selecting Jews for medical experiments whom they felt then they can use and see what reaction going to be. Interject them all kinds of liquids. Did some procedures. Anybody who get into these makeshift infirmaries and hospitals didn't survive. I happen to know a young lady She's 98, 97 or 98, a very fragile condition. She survived these experiments of Joseph Mengele, who was like a ringleader of that group. And he had a nickname, more appropriate than anything else you can. His name was the Angel of Death. Devastating. The remaining people were selected into two groups. People who were able to do Hard labor. They put them to one side. And other people, like women, children, the handicapped, the elderly, the weakling, put them on the other side. People who were put into to able to do forced labor, they took them immediately to Birkenau, stripped them everything, give them a uniform, and put them to work. Hard labor. Like sometimes you say, pounding salt. The other group were immediately taken to Auschwitz, stripped them and told them you will take a shower and shoved them into large rooms. And guess what? From the shower heads, in place of water, it was cyanide gas. See, they closed the door and opened the, the shower heads out. Devastating, devastating that to everybody there. When, so to speak, the air cleared up and the doors were opened, those people who were taken to the forced labor, they had to take the dead bodies to put them into the crematorium and burn them. And here are the ashes. They are not make-believe. There are over six million Jews who were slaughtered. So we say never again. And we must remember because history can repeat itself. Let's go back to Hungary. The next slide shows that the Hungarian government issued a law in April 5th of 1944. Every Jew of the country had to wear a yellow star. There was no excuse. And if you didn't put it on and somebody caught you, you were dead on the spot. There's no jokes. 
I left it. I was the yellow star. The only bright moment of the summer of 1944, go to the next slide, please. Then the Swedish government dispatched Roald Wallenberg. Happened to be, he wasn't a diplomat, but he had a dip diplomatic mission to protect Swedish properties in Hungary. And when he arrived, he immediately re recognized what is going on. By the way, Sweden and Switzerland were two countries in Europe who were neutral during the Second World War. And all other countries either were occupied by Germany or they had a puppet government in place. He came and he issued almost instantaneously Swedish documents to protect Jewish life. He worked with ambassadors who were sympathetic to his cause to save Jewish life. Thirdly, created what we call safe buildings. He stole the Nazis, the Hungarians, as well as the Germans. These are Swedish properties. You are not entered any one of them. My second cousin still lives in the same apartment where they moved in there under Rolf Wallenberg. He saved over 80,000 Hungarian Jews. Fast forward when the war ended in July of 1945, the Soviets tricked him to go to a meeting. And when he arrived, he was captured by them and accused him as a CIA spy. And we never have heard about him. More likely, he died in the Gulag. The next slide will show you a collage of pictures of Budapest of the summer of 1944. You can see people wearing a yellow star on the left hand side of the outer garment. The train, the building label, rounded up with guards. And how we were moving to the fall of 1944, the Hungarian government issued further restriction on Jewish life. I created, go to the next slide, created the Budapest Ghetto. Happened to be the Budapest Ghetto is located in the 7th district. And you see that two red circles? The red circle with nothing in it is the school I went to first grade. Later on, I actually went to fourth and fifth grade to the same school. And the red, other red circle around the black plus sign, that's a building my parents moved in 1940. We were very fortunate Then it was part of the Jewish ghetto, the Budapest ghetto. The ghetto size was very, very small. It was 74 acres. All the Jews of the city of Budapest were forced to move into that territory, and the non-Jews were asked to move out. There are over 80,000 Jews lived there. In some departments, there were two, three families who were crammed in. The streets, what you will see, all of them were blockaded by seven, eight foot stone walls. There were only four gates. So let me show you two pictures. One about a gate. Go to the next slide, please. It's a makeshift gate. You can see the Jewish star, the guard. But nobody was allowed to enter on, or leave. And the next slide will show you the stone walls. You couldn't climb. So I will tell you a couple of stories related to the, the Jewish ghetto of Budapest. It could have happened beginning of October of 1944. It was a beautiful day. We children of the building, over 150 of us, every now and then we were allowed to play in a courtyard under very strict supervision. Most of the time, like 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we were forced to stay, I call him a dungeon, is like a basement or a cellar but nothing like what you would think about it. You need to go to, up to Salem, Massachusetts to see what the dungeons look like. That's exactly what it was. It was storage area for 
heating material, wood and coal, for the apartment of the building. Thanks God, the cots and the blankets from the nursery kindergarten school. Then we didn't have to lay down on a wet clay flooring. We were fed one meal a day. You like it or not, that's what it. That in our building, there was one light bulb in that area. There were two small windows for ventilation. And we were told, our mouth keeps shut all the time. So nobody will hear where we are. And that was significant. So one day, we were playing, and I tripped, and I hit my head. And it started to bleed quite badly. And my mother, Clara, panicked. But my kindergarten teacher, Rose, said, Clara, I take care of Wendy. Immediately took my jacket, removed the yellow star, and she told me, Andy, you keep your mouth shut, you look down, hold my hand as hard as you can, and you walk with me. And we walked out of the building. Initially, we were told, we never leave the building under any circumstances, and we must wear the yellow star all the time. But Rose and I, we are walking out, and I was petrified. I didn't have a yellow star, and left the building. We went to the nearest gate to the hospital to patch up my head. When we arrived, it was a difficult task, because we had to go through the gate. And a Hungarian Nazi yelled at her, show me your ID. So Rose does. And then the guard yells again, well, you are not a Jew. You were supposed to move out of the ghetto. That was designated for the Jews only. And she very calmly said, I lost my husband a few years. I have no place to move, for I stayed in a one-room, one-bedroom apartment in a building I had been living. And can't you see, my son's head is bleeding, and I'm taking him to the hospital. Anyway, the God let us out eventually. I was patched up in a hospital on the way back. The God outside asked the same set of questions. But we get in. Of course, when we get back to the building, everybody was thrilled and happy. The moral of the story is significant. Number one, Rose never was married. By the way, in my time, there's no hanky-panky. She was a wonderful lady. Two, she was a devoted Catholic, never missed a mass. And thirdly, she understood humanity, and she was willing to sacrifice her life to save this Jewish boy who is talking to you today. Without her, probably I would not be around. The second story is related to the people who lived in a building. It could have happened sometimes early November. The Hungarian Nazis were coming into the building and harassing all the others. But when we children were told, keep our mouth shut, they never realized that in the dungeon area, there were over 150 kids hiding. The adults were rounded up and taken to a collection place. That was the norm. They come to collection place, doing some administrative work, Ship them to a railroad station, to concentration camps and that camps. And when they arrived to this collection place, there were thousands of Jews who were already lining up, bigger than a, f a football field. But my grandmother from the village noticed an SS guard, and she dashed up to him and started to speak in this strange German dialogue called Schwab. And I says, God was stunned, couldn't believe his ears. And instantaneously said, you are not a Jew, what are you doing here? They carried a conversation. He says, anybody who speaks this language cannot be a Jew. But my grandmother very calmly said, well, my sisters and my cousins were standing in line. We came up from the village. 
Hopefully the city of Budapest will provide a safer place because of the war. And as has got paused and said, take your family and go home. And everybody who was taken away from the building came back. The people who were there, they were not cousins or sisters of my grandmother. They were the people who lived in the building. Those are the people who took care of our, our 150 plus kids. They were looking after us. The bombardment of aeroplanes were continuous. You couldn't sleep. We were scared, we couldn't sleep, we were hungry, and we were just very miserable. That's what you go through as a child. I never forget those, uh, those days. The building was hit four times, practically destroyed the top floor. At night, I sneaked up from the dungeon area to the ground floor. I have seen searchlights were looking for aeroplanes, gunshots all the time. And the Hungarian Nazis were coming into the building almost every day. I have seen my mother and other members of our family who live with us, my kindergarten teacher, Rose, and others, with hands up facing the wall like that. It's a petrifying sight to see that when these dogs had guns, they could kill. But they didn't. They just physically and verbally abused everybody. How we were moving toward December, we realized that a war has to come to end. Things sort of calmed down by middle of December. We had radio, but we never could hear news because the Nazis were jamming the wavelengths all the time. And when we were getting close to Christmas, things really calmed down. And we knew sooner or later, more likely sooner, the war will end. And we turned to 1945 on the 17th of January. I never forget because it's also my grandmother's birthday. Two husky military persons shows up. With body language said, the Budapest ghetto is liberated. They so they were Soviet army personnel. Hungary was liberated by the Soviets by end of February of 1945. Of course, everybody was thrilled. We survived the Nazis. But what's next? So my grandmother from the village, who lived with us, said, I walk back and see if my home and my Business, she had the general store, is still existing, survived the war. She walked back about eight miles. And when she arrived, her very good friend, next door neighbor, a farmer's wife, not Jewish, have noticed her, dashed out of her house and hugged my grandmother and said, Thanks God, you survived the horrors of Second World War and the Nazis. And they carried a conversation. Go to the next slide. My grandmother owned that white dog. The name of the dog is Bundy. On the right hand side you see my cousin Tom, and on the other side is me. We played with the dog every time when we were visiting my grandmother. We loved that dog. And the friendly neighbor said to my grandmother, I have to tell you a, a terrible story. The war was practically over. The other neighbor of my grandmother was a Hungarian Nazi, had a gun, went back to his house, got his gun, came out, and guess what? Killed the dog. And a friendly neighbor said, what did you do that for? And I paraphrase because that's what my grandmother told me. It belonged to a Jew. It must die. 
This is what hatred costs. This is what anti-Semitism, this is the fascist government of Germany promoted and still lingering around in the 21st century. So my grandmother walked back and took my cousin Tom and me to the village. In the next picture, I show you my second grade class picture. I was second grade. We kids were able to get along. Everybody knew I am a Jew. We were maybe at a dozen Jewish kids there who came back to the village. We played around. The school was in a Catholic church because that's the only building which had space for schooling. Nuns and priests were teaching us. We kids get along. Now along that line, I like to tell you, no bullying. You don't make fun of each other on any circumstances. We are individuals and have certain skills and certain looks and certain behavior. But you must respect each other and be able to look into each other's eye and practically able to say, I love you as a human being. And you need to remember that. It's important to you today. Verbal abuse could damage you a lifetime. Physical abuse you can overcome. But verbal abuse you may never. By end of June, my mother came visit regularly to the village. Came and said, Andy, I take you home. You need to help me. You need to help to clean the house and cook. Seven and a half year old kid, I learned it. I do like to cook. And I learned the basic Hungarian cuisine. But I learned also to clean. You want to clean the floor? You get down on your knee with a brush and scrub. The convenience is what you have. We never had. You needed hot water. You had to build a fire in the stove to heat the water. That's how you did the laundry. By hand. The best example I can give you is refrigeration. We had what's called ice box, two words, ice box. The concept of refrigerator didn't exist yet, not even an imagination. Every day, a vendor came into the house in a courtyard and yelled, ice. So I went down there with the money my, my mother gave, and I bought a piece of ice, maybe a cubic feet. I brought it up there, and we had a box which has two compartments. One was designed to put an ice in there, the other one where you put the food in there. Just understand the life what you have, the conveniences, but you have no patience for them. Appreciate it. That's what your parents providing you. What happened with my dad? In the beginning of July of 1945, the same Rose who saved my life was screaming top of her lungs. My mother's name. It's Claro, Claro, Claro. So my mother and I, we dashed to the corridor in the top floor. And then she said, your husband is home. It didn't register. It was too complicated. When it did, I dashed from the top floor to the ground floor, faster than the speed of light. You should Google what the speed of light is. It's quite fast. I hugged the man. I kissed the man. I was crying and took three steps back to look at him. And what I tell you is hard to believe. I did not recognize my own dad. He may have weighed at 70 pounds. 
skin and bone, mentally, physically, emotionally, totally distraught. He survived the death camp called Mauthausen, which I showed it to you on a map. That was another very vicious death camp. And if you Google it, you will see the crematoriums and the gas chambers. It's a miracle. Then he made it. Just as a note, there is no medicine or vaccination against hate. If you and I have a responsibility to work hard to eliminate it and keep that in mind for the rest of your life. The Hungarian political system was very liquid, fluid. One government came to another one. One party took over versus the other one. Unfortunately, by end of 1949, the Socialist Party took over. They won the election. It didn't last that too long, because by late 1950, 50, early 51, the Communist Party won the election, and that was Soviet communism. I'd like to remind you a name, who was a very brutal man. His name is Joseph Stalin. He was the head of the Soviet Union. And he killed millions of his own people to protect Soviet style of communism. That's what Vladimir Putin tried to recreate. So I went to high school from 1951 to 55. It was a devastating time because we were very careful not to say anything to anybody unless it was sports or art or what you read in a paper, which was falsified information by the communists. Because if you said the wrong word, at best, you ended up in a principal's office. But you could end up in a police station or even worse. We felt that the walls have ears. They were bugged. My father and I, we were trying to listen every night. Voice of America, the BBC, the Free Europe Radio, the Hungarian broadcast, to hear what happening outside in the world. Because anything which was inside was not real. That was Soviet communism. Soviet communism provided the confiscation of all private properties. Makes no difference what it was. My father lost his license when he was trying to rebuild his business after when he came home. And just as all the note, when he came home, it took my mother over one year to nourish him back to real life. During that period of time, he was walking up in a two-room apartment, just like I'm walking here. Screaming, crying. And my mother said, Andy, leave that alone. He's reliving the horrors he went through in a death camp called Mauthausen. And under communism, it wasn't much better. On my senior year, I applied to go to university, and I was rejected. It says, undesirable element of society. Now, what the heck it means? Number one, my father was labeled a capitalist. And if you learn from your teacher, capitalism and communism is about 180 degree apart. See, capitalism is promoting entrepreneurship, creativity, competition. Soviet communism is trying to push people down to a low level of economical standards. There is much more to it. Two, everybody knew I'm a Jew. Here it is. That's my original birth certificate. In a red circle, you will see my name, the second line, my sex, third line, the abbreviation of my religion. And the next slide will show you the translation of my birth certificate. In a red box, 
says the same thing. And thirdly, we were very poor. We didn't have connections in high places to have influence to get into the university. So I went to a trade school after high school. One year. In the meanwhile, the political system so deteriorated that the Hungarians were really trying to do something, make a change. The unofficial politicians, underground politicians, academia, the intelligentsia, artists, writers, students, trying to organize some kind of a demonstration and a march to, to rise above Soviet communism in Hungary. And it took place on October 23rd of 1956. Tens of thousands of people get together in a large place. I was there. I was not quite 20. Listen to speeches. And when they were over, the leader said, we will march to the radio station and we will read a proclamation what the Hungarians want for the future replacing Soviet communism. And how we were going in another street, I happened to be in a front line. We get to the radio station, just as a note, Hungary, the whole country had two radio stations. Every village in the United States has a radio station. And when the leaders wanted to enter to read the proclamation, the two guards there who had guns didn't let anybody in. And they used these guns to disperse the crowd, but the crowd never dispersed. And that started the Hungarian Revolution, which lasted seven days, almost eight days. On my birthday, my 20th birthday, that was the happiest moment in my life. I was able to breathe freely. The Hungarian Revolution won. I had hope to go to school, get a diploma, hopefully get married, have family. During the Soviet occupation of Hungary, Soviet troops were walking in pairs all over around the city of Budapest, but all over the country. Everybody was scared all the time. If you see them, you try to cross the street to avoid them. When the revolution started, these people disappeared to the periphery of the various cities and localities. You didn't see them anymore. And about two weeks after the revolution won, they formed a revolutionary government a new word to creating peace and harmony in the country. The Soviets came back with vengeance, with armored vehicles, with tanks, thousands of troops, and destroyed everything in the city of Budapest, whatever the Hungarians achieved. There are over 50,000 Hungarians died during the revolution. And during that period of time, there are over 250,000 of Hungarians escaped to Austria, because we're hoping to living in a Western world is a much better place, no matter what Hungary is doing. And then, on November 23rd of 1956, in the morning, I, get, I, was, I was up and I told my parents, I say, I have no future in this country. I knew that thousands of people escaped already. I knew about a couple of classmates of mine from high school, left. I said, I'm leaving. We barely survived the Nazis. We barely survived the Soviets. What is the future for me? I was willing to gamble on my life to escape the country. And I left with an overcoat, 
kiss my parents and my little sister goodbye. And I said, God willing, there will be one day we will sit together and celebrate. Fast forward, after when I became citizen of the United States, I was able to bring my parents and my sister to the United States. And we did have a wonderful dinner when we could reminisce the time of the past. It took me three weeks to go from Budapest to Vienna. And you can look at the map, it's only about 240 miles. Okay? And when I arrived, and that's a long story, that trip, I was able to get to the American Embassy and get documents as a Hungarian refugee to come to the greatest country in the world called the United States of America. Don't ever forget it. There is no better place to live. You are blessed. I am blessed to be here. There is nothing better. You know, this country is not perfect. It has a lot of black spots. And if you make an effort to learn black history, I lived in the South for many years. Then you will know that it was not always roses. And you look at today, we have a difficult society. But I got my papers and the designated time and day, I had to go to a location, we were transported to the train station, and a train went to Bremenhaven, Germany, the largest seaport. And go to the next slide, please. And then over 3,000 Hungarian refugees boarded into this ship, a transfer ship called the Marine Corp. It's a very tiny ship, it was only 40,000 tons. But that ship transported American soldiers from the United States to France during the Second World War. It also participated in the Korean War. Thanks God I wasn't seasick. I was able to help the staff to do things. I didn't speak any English. But because I wasn't seasick, I was able to get to the top deck and smell the ocean fresh salty air. Described to you the last day. I am on a top deck with a bunch of other guys. And in a distance I have noticed something very, very beautiful. Beautiful is just a description. It's a statue. And I started to cry because I recognized the statue from my history book. Then it is the Statue of Liberty. And go to the next slide. Here it is. This is the most beautiful lady I ever had put my eyes on. It's even more beautiful than my wife. That lady represents one word to all of us. It's called freedom. I didn't have freedom until when I did see that lady. Freedom of speech, freedom of choice, freedom of religion, and many other freedoms what we have. This country will give it to you. Respect it. Ignore Republicans or Democrats or independents care less what this country creates. We all are immigrants. Do a little bit of research. Look at where your great grandfather came from or great grandmother or around that time frame. They are not Native Americans. They came from some place. Just like I came from Hungary. My son and my daughter were born here. Born here. But we are all immigrants. We created the greatest country in the world. Ingenuity, imagination, competition. That's what this country stands for. There is a poem in a plaque on the statue, written by a Jewish lady in the second half of the 19th century. 
and let me read it to you. Give me your tired, your poor, your whole masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest toast to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. You can see that torch. It represents the gate of the greatest country in the world. The next slide will show you reality about anti-Semitism. Look at it. In 2021, there are close to 2,800 anti-Semitic incidents occurred in the United States of America, which is 34%, one-third of increase from the previous year. Unfortunately, you cannot stamp it out. We need to do that. We need to eliminate hate. And we will be better off. And I picked that particular quotations from one of the greatest civil rights leaders, from John Lewis. He passed away a few years ago. He was a congressman for over two years from the state of South Carolina. And he put it in very well. And he says, I believe in freedom of speech, but I also believe that we have an obligation to condemn speech that is racist, bigoted, anti-Semitic, and hateful. We need to remember how important the freedom that we have. And we need to cherish it. The next few slides is very personal. The next one is actually very important in one respect to you, which is on the right-hand side. The top eight, I played soccer in Hungary, and I was playing in a semi-professional league. I was on a varsity team in college, my college graduation picture. But on the right-hand side, you see three pictures. And that's going to tell you something very, very important. See, when you are born, is given a toolbox, and it is your responsibility to use those tools to make your future. Everybody has different tools. We are not the same, but we are the same. Try to remember. We are wonderful human beings with creativity. And if you decide on do something, in life, then you succeed. You just have to work hard, perseverance, and don't compare what you can do with your fellow students or your friends, because we do the things differently. I was 75 years at age. A young lady, a colleague of mine, we worked together on a project. And she said, Andy, I want you to do something called the triathlon. And I said, what is it? I never heard of it. She says, well, it's three sports. Swimming, riding a bike, and running. You can do that. I said, you must be crazy. I am 75. I haven't exercised for 40 years. How can I do that? Oh, you can do that. So describe what it is. This particular triathlon required a half, a, a little more than a half a mile swim in an open water. That means a lake or a river or an ocean. Ride a bicycle a little over 12 miles in a tough terrain, many hills, and then run five kilometers, which is 3.1 miles. And I said, I never can do that. I'm too old for that kind of a games. But I registered. I spent $100. And I trained for four months, six days a week. My wife was ready to divorce me. So you're never home. You're either in a pool or running or riding a bike. How about spending some time at home? But on the day, or the first Wednesday 
of July, which is a quasi amusement park, not very far from here. There were over 400 of us there. Youngest one was 13, and I was the oldest one. Everybody was having fun. It caught up with me. When a whistle blown to go to the lake to swim, I was in the fourth group to go into the lake because the entrance was very short. But when I get into the water, I only said, please God help me because I believe in things. First leg. Look at it. I'm coming out of the water. And I run to the bike to pick it up. And I said, please God help me to get to the second leg. I got on a bike and I was riding and we had four or five terrifying hills. I thought I'd never make it. At the sides of the road, people were clapping, go, 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 everybody. Here it is, I'm coming back with my bike, over 12 miles. And then I said, thanks God, I have it made. Because the worst case, I can walk as slow as my body will allow me. I can run. I run as hard as I could. The last little over a quarter mile was very hilly. And I really, my legs were heavier than tons. But I did run. And I'm running and coming to the finish line. I got 10 minutes off from that time. So I did the course in less than two hours and 10 minutes. I put my mind to it. I work very hard. And if you do that, you can be anything, anything. So don't ever say no to yourself. You just have to say, try. And if you try, you su succeed in life. And you will be always happy. The next slide, just a quick picture. On the left hand side is a family picture visiting my second, second cousin in Budapest in 2017. On the right hand side is the top picture having a dinner with a very dear friend in Tel Aviv, Israel. He is from New Haven. I met his wife when he was studying in Jerusalem. In the bottom picture, we were walking in a shopping area in Jerusalem, and my wife and I, we bumped into this lady who was our neighbor back in Binghamton, New York. Haven't seen her for over 30 years. The next slide just gives you a picture. There are three pictures you can see. After that triathlon, every year I did a triathlon. Actually, in one year I did two, practically back to back. And I did at least five or six 5Ks. Unfortunately, five years ago I had a major heart attack. And my body is just not able to compete. By exercise, this week I took off. By exercise, five days a week. Yoga, spinning, cardio, and just working on machines. And when the weather is nice, I try to run in my neighborhood and ride my bike. I have a very expensive bike. In the middle, in the bottom part, is my wife and I in the beaches of Milford. And on the top, on the left, is a family picture where my grandson, that little guy in the black outfit with the glasses, had a bar mitzvah. At age 13, is a Jewish custom to get a boy involved with religious duties. And that was a family picture. You can see me, and next to me, next to me in a white dress is my wife. Okay. Behind me is my son David, his wife, and the two kids. And behind my wife is my of our daughter, Andrea, her husband, and three children. Those children are very much grown. I have a, a daughter, you see that, is graduated from Hunter. I have a grandson who is in Israel. The youngest one is in, a freshman in high school. 
on my son's side, my uh, uh, grandson is a junior in college, and the younger one is uh, in Israel uh, studying religious studies. The next slide is just a certificate I received from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum for the volunteer work I do for you guys to give talks and tell you my life story. And for closure, I wish you all good luck, hard work, and eliminate hate, have love, and hope, and wish you all well. Good luck.